Tin Hawk Journeyverse Journeys Part 7 When he reached the church, he noticed the light was still on in the rectory, so he knocked and went in. Inside, the old priest was seated comfortably in an old chair, talking animatedly on the phone. Yes, yes, I see. That's very... Oh, wait, he's back. Yes, he looks fine. Would you like to speak with him, Mr. Giles? One second. Here he is. The priest grinned at Xander's confusion. I was curious about those demons, so I hit redial. An interesting man, this Mr. Giles. Once knew someone like him myself. Xander grinned slightly and accepted the phone. Hello, G-Man. No, I'm fine. No, not a bite. The town is dead at night, not undead. Okay, I'll give that a shot this evening. Anything else? Well, that's good, at least. Okay, you get some sleep, too. I'll probably check in on you before I go out. No, don't tell the others. They'd only worry, and there isn't anything they can do. Okay. Talk to you later. Bye. Zanda laid the phone down. Well, nothing tonight. But G-Man says that there's a good chance I can find them tonight if I can figure out where the power center of the caster is. Shouldn't be too hard in a town like this. There can't be that many mystical centers of powers. Where would you look? Giles told me that they usually have certain signs around them. A network of caves with an underground stream might do, or a series of hot springs. The priest shook his head as Xander listed off things Giles had mentioned. Well, they could use a grove of... Xander trailed off. What? Damn it! Xander cursed and remembered where he was. Sorry, Father. I just had a Homer Simpson moment. That grove I pulled those kids out of yesterday. That's the place. They were preparing a sacrifice and I busted it up. I should have seen it. The priest laid his hand on the boy's shoulder. You see it now. That will have to do. Now you must get rested for your work tonight. Xander nodded reluctantly. You may have a bed here, child. It's only a cot, but it will do better than your car's back seat. Thank you, father. It watched as the boy drifted off to sleep. Now was the time. Now or never. It would reveal itself to the boy and cast its lot to the wind. Should the fates or fortune smile, then the time ahead would be interesting indeed. Calmly, it waited, and when the boy began to dream, it slowly slipped inside and began to call. He ducked under the fire, huddling tight to the ground as the flames scorched the air above his head. He could feel his hair singeing in the heat, and he rapidly patted his head down with his free hand to make certain there were no actual flames. The smell was sickening, a combination of scorched hair and the smell of frying flesh that permeated the rest of the room. Couldn't remember how he had gotten into this mess. His mind kept screaming that it would be real. He could feel the heat, see the monster breathing flames, smell the stench, and yet his mind rebelled against it, told him that something was wrong, that something, that his own senses were lying to him. He ignored his gut, as much as he hated to do. What his eyes were telling him was too dangerous to ignore. He rolled to his feet, pulling a pistol from his hip, and fired at the beast. Alexander. He shook his head, trying to clear it. Stay focused. He kept shooting, trying to drag the beast down with sheer firepower. Alexander. The voice was more persistent now. It dragged his attention away from the... The what? What was I sh... What was I doing? Alexander, I am behind you. He spun around and almost dropped on his ass at the vision in front of him. She stood six foot tall easily. Her hair showered down around her shoulders like a light rain. Literally, Xander realized as he stared at her. Her hair was a sea of green, casting odd reflections on her lily-white skin. Around her left eye was a light blue tattoo that depicted a design Xander thought was familiar from some of Giles' books. Sort of a layered design surrounding her eye on three sides, with a tail that followed her jawline down to the neck, and continued down to her shoulder where it disappeared under the armor she was wearing. Xander blinked. It was barely armor, he realized. Her breastplate, which barely covered her chest, was a combination of partial plate and chainmail that hung raggedly under her breast, dangling loosely and exposing her midriff. Xander swallowed. Hard. Her waist was covered in the same fashion, a partial plate decorated with the hanging pieces of chainmail that only seemed to accentuate her legs. 
Her boots were among the few things she was wearing that seemed somewhat practical, being armored and running up to her shins to just above her knees at the front, and just below at the back. Who... who are you? Xander couldn't break his eyes away. I am. I was called Elenthiel. Was? Xander was almost afraid to voice the words. I was sacrificed many thousands of years ago. I no longer have a name, as you would know it. Okay. Say I buy that for a moment, and in truth, Xander did buy it. In fact, though, he wasn't sure why. Everything seemed very believable to him right now. What do you want with me? She smiled, something that radiated through Xander and illuminated the entire place he found himself in. The reason you believe me is because this is the dreaming. It is human nature to believe everything they see here, at least until they awake. I'm asleep. It wasn't a question. He knew it for the truth before he spoke. Yes, she smiled again, but I am real, as you shall learn when you awake. What are you? Now that he understand the situation, at least somewhat, he could see that this was a hell-mouthy kind of deal. Lanthiel's eyes flashed in anger. I am not associated with that abhorrent portal. Xander backpedaled quickly, his hands raised in supplication. Sorry, sorry, I didn't mean anything like that. Hellmouthy is just how I describe anything that doesn't seem to fit my definition of normal. Her ire died quickly as it flared, and her smile returned, bringing a feeling of peace to Xander. I apologize. Understand, Alexander, I am very old and have battled demons and monsters from places you cannot imagine for over a thousand years before I was sealed. I will not be compared to them. Okay, I can, uh, get that. I wouldn't want to be compared to them myself. I've only been fighting them for a couple years. Three years, or very nearly, Alexander. You have done well for someone thrust into the battle with no formal training. Uh, thanks, I guess. Xander shifted uncomfortably. Uh, not to rush you or anything, but... What do you want with me? Elanthiel smiled slowly. I am a rune staff, Alexander. I wish you to be my bearer. Huh? She sighed and began to recite as if from the book. Rune magic is an ancient and thankfully lost form of magic. It channels a sentient soul into an item of power, in my case a battle staff, during a sacrificial ritual. Since a soul is immortal, the item becomes virtually indestructible, and the soul is bound for all eternity to it. I was made to defend against outside threats, and I wish to do so again. It gives me purpose. Xander stared at her in shock. You were sacrificed and imprisoned in a weapon, he whispered in shock. He had once thought vampiric immortality was scary. I was, she said simply, if a bit sadly. I... well... Xander stammered slightly, trying to turn her down. Then he looked at her, and was lost in the pure emotion he saw, in her sea-green eyes. What do I have to do? Lanthiel smiled at him again, warming him to the core. You just did. Wake now, Alexander. And remember. And Xander woke. He sat bolt upright in her cot, eyes locked and staring straight ahead at the residual image of the sea-foam eyes. Slowly he blinked, once and twice, then a third time, until his vision cleared. Jesus, he whispered. What a dream. Xander trailed off as his hand closed tightly around the cool metal cylinder that he remembered seeing during his visit to Bucklands with Phoebe. Oh, shit. Xander sat on the edge of his cot, staring at the metal cylinder for a long moment. Finally, he turned it over slowly, wondering how he was supposed to use it. Just will me to activate, the voice whispered through his mind, startling him for a moment as he looked over his shoulder for the speaker. Finally calming down, he twisted the cylinder, no, the weapon, and staring at it, he thought one word, activate. The weapon bucked in his hand, extending three feet on each side in a blinding flash. 
The top part rocketed past his eye, narrowly missing knocking him out cold, while the bottom crunched solidly into his big toe. Ah! Xander screamed as he dropped the staff. Son of a... He hopped around the room for a moment, cursing wildly under his breath. The old priest, hearing his screams, rushed into the room. Are you all right? No, Xander groaned, cradling his foot as he balanced precariously on one. I think I broke my toe. How? the priest asked. Did you stub it on something? No, I, uh, yeah, I, I stopped it. That's what happened. Then they collapsed into the cot, still cradling his foot. You should be more careful, the priest looked at him oddly. I will let you get dressed. Sure, and I'll take more care. Xander managed to get out between clenched teeth. After the priest left, Xander picked up the metal staff, seething in anger. You could have warned me, he hissed. Sorry, came a giggling voice. It's been thousands of years since I've been used, and I've never been wielded by someone without training before. At least stop laughing, he said, his voice turning plaintive. I'll try, he heard between snickers. Ah, crap. Xander muttered, deactivating the weapon and starting tossing on his clothes. Xander limped out into the main room of the rectory, with the land tucked into a deep pocket and the twin colts riding in a leather under his baggy shirt. Hey, Padre, Xander started. Is there a military surplus shop in town? The priest nodded. Yes, there's one downtown. A man named Terence runs it. He's considered a little... odd. Xander grinned. My kind of guy. I'm going to visit there before closing. What time is it? Almost five. You'd better hurry. You slept most of the day. Xander nodded and headed out the door to his car. The shop was dark, cluttered, and filled with things that caused Xander to break into a smile the second he walked in. Okay, focus. Can't afford much. Just a couple of basics. He browsed through, still limping in pain from the fractured toe and gripped a pistol belt and a couple of Alice clips. He looked longingly at the body armor hanging on the wall, but kept moving. Next, he grabbed a canvas sheath designed for maglites, figuring that it would hold the land securely. Next, he looked through the knives, finally picking up a solid, thick-bladed knife with a straight edge and a chiseled tip. The blade had been carbon coated, matte black finish, and only the razor-sharp edge gleamed with reflected light. His soldier memories identified the blade, for him, Tanto, Japanese dagger, modernized though, Americanized actually, debatable whether it was an improvement, but it's still a good weapon. It was expensive, over a hundred dollars, but Xander added it to the pile anyway. Trip was shot to hell anyways, I'll cut it short and head back to Sunny D. Terence watched the boy as he selected things from around the store. The whole town was talking about this kid. He'd been the one who saved the kids the other night. Terence watched the boy move, recognized his motions. Aside from the limp, the kid moved like a soldier. Wonder where he learned that. The boy finally stopped browsing and came up to the register, laying his selection down with a wry grin. Bring it up. This has been Tin Hawk's Journeyverse Journeys, Part 7. Links below.